Now it's good? All right, good morning, and welcome to the Deep Space Food Movement. Uh, we're really excited. I hope you've had a great week here at the conference and can think of a better way to wrap it up than uh, with this panel this morning. Um, I'm super excited about it to uh, introduce them. My name is Robin Gatens, and I'm the director for the International Space Station uh, from NASA headquarters. And uh, the group asked me to kind of kick this off this morning and give a little context um, for what brought us to this moment here today. Um, so besides my space station role, I've also served as NASA's capability leader for life support and crew health and performance systems. And one of the biggest challenges we have for supporting the crew on long duration missions is the food system. Today on the International Space Station, we're able to send a wide variety of food items, about 200. We're able to send up preference foods. We're able to send up fresh foods whenever we launch cargo, uh, even things like pizza kits. When we take a trip to Mars for a three-year round trip, we're not gonna have the ability to um, resupply that mission. Everything that the uh, crew has, they have to take with them. And so the, the food system is one of the biggest challenges that we have for a long duration mission like that. Um, the, the system has to sustain the crew both um, physically, but also psychologically. So it has to have variety, it has to be safe, it has to be nutritious. Um, and uh, all those things are a big challenge. So it occurred to us a few years ago when we were thinking about this, that there's a huge intersection between the needs that we have at NASA for a deep space food system and the needs here on Earth for food systems in harsh environments and small spaces and where resources are scarce. And so I partnered with uh, my very good friend and colleague, Monsi Rahman, who wishes she could be here today. Um, and if you know Monsi, you know she is a force of nature. Uh, full of creativity. Uh, she runs NASA's Centennial Challenges Program. And it occurred to us this was a perfect problem for a crowdsourcing challenge. So we, uh, along with Monsi and the Methuselah Foundation, um, partnered together to conceive of the Deep Space Food Challenge and were able to launch it this past year. And we just couldn't be um, more pleased with the response, which you'll hear more about. Um, and so uh, I'm excited. Uh, we're also really thrilled to have the support of Martha Stewart and, and her partnership in this with us, and along with all of our commercial partners and, uh, and, and the folks you'll hear from on the stage here and our international partners. So uh, again, thank you and welcome. Thanks for being here. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dane from Methuselah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, I'm so happy to be here. I'm Dane Goebel. I'm the program director of Methuselah Foundation, and uh, I'm so happy to be, uh, be working on the Deep Space Food Challenge with, with NASA Centennial. Um, uh, as Robin said, the response has been pretty staggering. We, uh, we launched in January. Um, very quickly uh, went viral in India. Um, we had a huge number of teams um, sign up from what ended up being 27 different countries. We ended up with uh, 250 final teams who um, went through the whole process and were verified and ready to go. Um, and we then came up with, um, it was 190 actual final applications. Um, it, was a, it was an extensive process, a very serious design application similar to, uh, to a grant proposal uh, to produce food systems, as she said. Uh, we'll be going into phase two um, notionally. Uh, it's not totally set, but that's what we're, we're hoping to do soon, uh, which will be a table demonstration. But for, for the first phase, they uh, put together a lengthy application and a video pitching uh, their food systems and did a truly incredible job. And so many people from, from different industries came together to do this. So everybody from astrophysicists to food technologists to, to chefs, both from, uh, you know, people working, uh, you know, students in the university to uh, small startups to larger established companies, everybody coming together to, to figure out how to actually approach this problem. Um, we ended up with uh, 18 US winners, uh, 10 international winners, and 10 Canadian winners. 
uh, and we're so excited to see what they're going to do in the next uh, the next phase of this. Um, so now I'll kick it over to uh, to Florina, who will kick off our fireside chat. Thank you. Excuse me. Hello, everyone. I'm Florina Linko. I'm the communications director for the Methuselah Foundation, um, working very closely with uh, NASA and the, and the Canadian Space Agency on the Deep Space Food Challenge. Uh, Dane and I are privileged and honored to lead this, and we have seen so much excitement and passion for uh, this um, crowdsource challenge, and we're very excited to share more about that with you, but more importantly, discuss the broader themes um, associated with uh, deep space food, including uh, and especially uh, terrestrial or Earth applications. So um, with that, I'd love to uh, ask everyone here on stage with me to briefly introduce yourselves and share why you're personally uh, interested in food and food sustainability. So Bernard, would you like to start? Yeah. Oui. So hello, I'm, I'm Bernard Twang, so I come from the moon. <laughs> and uh, actually I've, I'm a rocket scientist and astrophysicist. I've studied with the space probe, the sun, stars, and I sent my baby to the moon, a little probe called Smart One, uh, that's why there, uh, Mars mission, we will have uh, one ExoMars that uh, we launch next year that will search for life on Mars eventually. And, and um, uh, now, after my time at uh, ESA, we have uh, created a, um, a platform. Okay, so let's go fast about the, the slide. I, I can show fast uh, what we have done. We have created a, a vision for a moon village where we are going. Oh, yes, this one. Where we are going to. Um, um, this is a place where I want to invite you to have a, a moon base where I plan to retire in 20 years and I, I want you to join me. And uh, we have a vision where uh, we will uh, build a robotic village, but that a moon village that will be very inclusive of everybody. And so actually we built the base that's on the top of a Hawaii volcano. You can go there and learn how to live, how to work, uh, what will be the way to operate. And we are growing food there and we are sharing this food. So we can also do hard work in the field, collect the soil, and uh, the moon soil is, uh, we have even grown plants out of it. And uh, this is uh, some of our team that we lock for a few weeks there, you see all smiling, and we grow food for them. They also take care of growing their own food. And they do experiment, uh, uh, biology, uh, also we did a diet and food experiment. And so, Overall, okay, uh, we want to, uh, uh, to uh, we are, are running some of these campaigns, so you are welcome to join. So that's our Your Moon Mars platform. Uh, I have also brought a little piece of the moon with me uh, to show you. And another program we have is Art Moon Mars, where we want to fly a gallery of art to the moon, but we can talk later about that. Thank you. Hello, my name is Helen Tapper. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I um, am currently the director at the International Fund for Agricultural Development, um, which is a hybrid between an international financial institution and a United Nations specialized agency, specifically working with um, smallholder farmers, the ones that are most left behind and the ones who really um, have a very big role to play in feeding our planet. And so that obviously there's a, a very um, strong link between the work that we do in terms of innovating in the financial sector to make sure no one is left behind, especially in rural development, and the work that is being done here. Um, I've traveled the world quite a bit. I have a, a background in um, peace and security and peacekeeping, and that's really where I spent most of my life um, trying to work with the communities most left behind ensuring that their voices make a difference in the future that we're building together. Because we, if we don't address that, any of the solutions that we come up with will not really reflect the realities of what people are living across the world. And therefore, we won't be able to really more move forward in this concept of building back better. There are amazing solutions, amazing knowledge across the world um, that communities have developed uh, from the, the, the Amazon and the indigenous communities to the far and most remote areas in, in many of the um, African continent where I lived, um, including across Asia. 
that have developed solutions based on their ecosystems, that are the developing solutions uh, to face climate change. So uh, this is a way to circle back between local solutions, localized knowledge, remembering that our humanity matters and that everybody's identity matters, and linking that to the amazing technology that is being developed um, through deep space exploration. So it's a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for including me in this uh, fantastic uh, Congress, uh, the IAC, the Deep Food Space Challenge, as well as Methuselah Foundation. I'm Martha Stewart. Um, I'm sort of an oddball up here, um, not being a scientist, but being an interested kind of participant in uh, what we're talking about here today, food sustainability, uh, space travel, et cetera. Um, my, I'm probably a little older than most of you in the audience, uh, and I've lived through the 1950s um, when um, Einstein and Asimov and the other really great science fiction writers were uh, working hard at whetting our appetites for uh, both science as well as space travel. And then in 1968, a movie came out uh, directed by Stanley Kubrick. Um, it was called 2001 Space Odyssey. I think everybody, if you haven't seen it, and I hope you've seen it, but if you haven't, you should uh, revisit that particular movie, one of the great movies of all time. And very little attention, by the way, was paid in that movie to food on that fantastic spaceship. Um, that was not, but everything else was pretty accurate if you look at, back at it, an awful lot of accuracy in that production, but not so much about food. Uh, and then in the 70s, um, I spent a lot of time with Kurt Vonnegut, um, who was writing crazy books like The T Sirens of Titan and uh, Slaughterhouse-Five, and, and he was saying great things um, that we could have saved the Earth, but we were too damn cheap. Um, things like that, which are no, lo it's no longer a problem. We have lots of billionaires out there who really want to save the Earth, but also want to travel to space, and we should take advantage of all of that and not malign those, those new uh, explorers into outer space, and, but yet support them with our encouragement. Um, and I'm, I'm just so interested in um, everything that's uh, going on with uh, this uh, Deep Food Space Challenge. In 1996, this image of me, three images of me, appeared in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. And uh, it's kind of a beautiful image. Uh, they had asked me what I would think of the kitchen of the future would look like. And there I have my fish growing in tanks right in my kitchen. I have uh, beautiful views, um, that picture window is can be changed. I could, I could visit any place on earth I wanted with a photograph. I had a dishwasher that was not only a dishwasher, but it was also where I stored all my dishes and pots and pans. So only one set of dishes, and you just took out the dish you needed and used it. The table, that wonderful long counter, could be raised or lowered on air currents so that there were no legs, nothing to worry about dirty underneath. You didn't have to worry about legs. You could sit to Tommy style or stand up and, or sit down at a chair. Um, hydroponic growing, of course, for all your greens and lettuces and microgreens uh, and vegetables. So that kind, of, that kind of really got me interested in the future of farming. And I sit now on the board of a, a new company called App Harvest down in Kentucky, uh, utilizing, we, were, we had hoped, the uh, retired uh, coal workers in Appalachia, um, they weren't so interested, a lot of them aren't so interested in, at, yet anyway, in taking care of plants and greenhouses, but the, the way that things can be grown in controlled environments is very important to solving not only space travel food, but also the food of the world. So I'm, I'm it sounds like I'm all over the place, but I'm really, really, really devoted to finding a way to grow sustainably, provide food long-term for the rest of the world, as well as to encourage um, travel out into space. And don't ask me if I want to go. I do want to go. I've done zero gravity. <laughs> and after, after uh, maybe these little space travel um, operations that are, you know, SpaceX and, and Blue Origin and those others, once I get a little bit more expertise, uh, maybe I'll go on one of those trips. It'd be fun. If William Shatner can do it, I certainly can do it. <laughs> By the way. <laughs> Good morning.
morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ben Greaves. Um, I'm currently an engineer with Star Lab Oasis. Um, and I just want to thank the whole uh, Deep Space Food Challenge team for letting me sit next to Martha Stewart this oh. morning. <laughs> um, I am the son of a uh, nutritionist and a community organizer. And so this is, I, I really care deeply about kind of um, global food as well as you know how we can make sure that we have a sustainable uh, food future in space um, you know from creation to distribution um, and so I think this is such an important topic that fortunately everyone can be involved in that's one thing that I've been able to enjoy this past uh, few days here at IAC is that um, you know everyone has an experience with food food matters to everybody um, and everyone brings their own perspective um, and so that's why it's just been such an incredible topic to be a part of. Um, you can see we have such like diversity up here in terms of the different skill sets um, and that's going to be what's needed in order to make sure that we have a sustainable food future. Thank you. Hello, I'm Hannah Millman. I'm a founder of Vegetable Mineral and we source the natural world. Um, I worked with Martha for 28 years um, doing stories on American makers and farmers across the country. And it's just incredible to see what people are doing innovatively and just the, you know, 10th, 11th generation farmers. Um, and I agree, um, just everything what Martha said, but there's no excuse that we can't feed everyone um, and really nutritious food. So for me, it's a lot of the terrestrial aspects that we are working on with space, um, the Deep Space Challenge and all these innovators um, on how we can feed people on Earth. Um, so I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me. It's a really a pleasure and a honor for me being, uh, being here representing Astra <laughs> as well. Um, my name is Anil Kumar Dave. I'm a space strategy lead for, uh, for Astra. We, um, we are one of the participants to the competition and uh, with a consortium um, named uh, Mission Space Food. Um, well, I must say that I'm here because I love food and that that is uh, just enough <laughs> to, to be here. But, um, well, what we do, um, we design new space food and new space uh, food systems for, uh, for this space, for uh, new space missions and, and so on, but uh, combining the nutrition need of astronauts with hedonics. So hedonics is the branch of psychology that is studying uh, the pleasure and unpleasure feelings. Um, because studies have shown that, uh, you know, we eat uh, with eyes, but eating is, uh, or food is the only um, uh, sector, is the only thing that is fulfilling and encompassing all the senses we, we are using. So um, we are designing that, we are doing that, but what we want to do is uh, to become, let's say, um, okay, we mentioned earlier the science fiction, um, science fiction film and movies. Um, I will mention Ratatouille just to be uh, on a lower uh, <laughs> scale. If you, um, if you remember the movie, so what we would like to become is the next uh, not one-stop shop, one, one-stop Gusto restaurant because uh, we have all the three aspects of, uh, of Gusto restaurant because uh, anyone can cook. Okay, any astronaut can cook. This is what <laughs> we would like to, to make it. And the second one is that uh, good food for good nutrition. And the third one is that food has a psychosocial role because it's an incredible team building uh, uh, way of doing things. And uh, this is also what uh, you know we are encompassing in when we say that human factors are very much linked to food. So this is what we would like to do also in, in space. Last but not least, what is very much interested for us is the, the fallback of what we can do in space, studying for space and uh, let's say have impact on, on Earth. And this is also what my colleague and panelists said. My name is Anil Kumar Dave. I'm a former head of uh, Technology Transfer for the Italian Space Agency. And uh, as said, I really love food. <laughs> right. My name is Stefan de Mer. I'm from the European Space Agency. Um, I'm, as everyone, a food expert. I practice three times a day, some days more. <laughs> um, in real life, I, I work on the strategy of our uh, Human Exploration Directorate. Um, uh, it's thinking about sending our astronauts to low Earth orbit today, um, to, to the moon tomorrow, to Mars one day. But it's also about bringing the benefits um, back to the humans on Earth today. We don't wait until we're on Mars to benefit from what we're doing. 
um, and that goes in different directions. Um, you heard optimizing the food going to the ISS is one thing, um, but if we go to Mars, we cannot bring everything, so we think also how to grow food in space um, and, and find the technologies for doing that. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. We're so honored to have everyone here on the stage. So I just wanted to kick us off. If you can help us level set, what are some of the biggest challenges um, we face on Earth with regard to food sustainability, from your perspective? Helen? It looks like you're reaching for your mic. <laughs> just to be ready. <laughs> um, some of the biggest challenges. Um, the way we produce and consume food today is just unsustainable. It has to change. Up to 800,000 million people are currently hungry. Uh, Three billion people cannot afford healthy diets. Crop yields are falling, growing seasons shifting, uh, less fresh water is available. Extreme weather events are occurring more often. We're hearing about uh, the effects of climate change almost 24 hours a day now. It's causing economic losses, affecting food security. And so this is something that we need to address because what we're talking about here is actually going back to the core of our survival. We're talking about the access to basic services, the access to food, to water, to nutrition, which makes our humanity capable of moving forward. And without that, um, we are risking more and more uh, potential of war, of conflict, of disease. We're just facing and still facing this global pandemic. We need to start using the amazing resources that exist across the world, as well as the capacity to leverage more agile mechanisms to be able to support this uh, movement forward and to be able to use technology to support how we are going to address this uh, emergency that we're facing today. We, and, and I will talk a little bit about this more later, but um, specifically, we're currently working um, with EFAD on making sure that small scale farmers are getting what they need. They are the backbone of our food systems. They produce a third of the food for our planet. And the situations that they're facing are quite dramatic when you see the importance that they're playing in terms of our, um, our needs and the food that we eat. So we'll talk more about those people behind our plates in, in just a little bit. But really, it is time for us to all be together to break down the silos that exist so that together we can find sustainable and regenerative solutions as we move forward. Bernard, would you like to go? Yes, so uh, I say food is about harvest. We have to harvest the best of our abilities. And space, we are here to help. Because for instance, from space, we have a program Space for Earth, where we monitor the Earth at in all possible uh, wavelengths. We can monitor water, we can monitor half of the key indicator for climate change. And now we have uh, the access to all the satellites that can observe the Earth uh, daily at the very high resolution. And using the revolution of artificial intelligence, now we can develop tool where we can help the users, local users, providers, we can also teach them how to use them uh, to uh, make use of this uh, Earth observation data. Now some people will say, so let's keep it to the Earth. No, also by going exploring, we can uh, address other sustainable de development goals. We can educate the kids from all over the world. And that's what we, ha what we have to harvest. All the brilliant mind, all the young kids, and make them part of the solution and get them also in applying at a local level uh, all possible innovative uh, uh, solutions. And so that's why, uh, yeah, space is here to help. I love it. Emile, did you have something to add? Um, well, I'm, I'm just backing what Bernard said because space is here to help. But um, if we look at the other way around, space can be also, um, let's say, the analog of Earth. Because if you consider the conditions in space, it's harsh environment, the need of you know water, uh, resources, energy, and so on. In the long run, those are the challenges and the problem that also Earth will face. 
uh, water uh, scarcity and uh, you know and others. So if you find solutions to maybe um, create or generate food in space uh, according to these constraints, you know, and this, definitely you can go back to Earth and find uh, uh, apply those solutions also also there. And I think that this maybe you know having this kind of other opposite view, the other way around, could be also very much of help. So space is there for help. And space food definitely, yes, is there for, for help for us. Absolutely. Stefan? So I th and maybe to continue, in space we don't look at each problem separately. So we don't look at food, oxygen, water separately. We look at in an integrated way. Um, and at ESA, for instance, we have a program called MELISA. Uh, and it's about developing a closed-loop life support system. So the system creates the food purifies the water, takes out the um, CO2, turns it into oxygen, um, recycles the waste all in one system. Um, and, and that's uh, how we try to do it. And that's directly connected to a circular economy uh, on, on Earth. Now, I, what you mentioned is so true. I mean, every building, I live in New York City, and every building in New York City should be that. Like it should be this self s system, um, and I grow a lot of things on the roofs of New York City, and they gr it's zone five and six. It grows we really well, so activating that. Yeah. Excellent. I had mentioned about uh, these controlled environment farming that's being developed all over the world now. Um, it's extremely um, productive. Uh, Thirty times more produce can be grown in uh, per acre than uh, on an acre in the ground. Uh, One-tenth of the amount of water is necessary in this kind of controlled environment. The plants last longer. Um, at, at harvest, we're growing tomatoes that are 45 feet tall and produce fruits for uh, more than nine months. So this is a very sensible way of growing. Um, it, is, um, it is being used in Russia. It's being used in uh, Holland. It's being used in Mexico. In uh, Dubai here, I think they have... Uh, 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 lots of uh, greenhouse growing and other places in the Middle East. But I think it's, um, it is um, a very important part of the future of agriculture as, yeah. our, as our land is becoming made uh, you know, more and more uh, useless. Also, just one thing. Mo a lot of farmers I know, they have this as a supplement. So they all do basic soil farming, but then they'll have a container that is so they can do in the winter, they can continue growing. Um, so I guess it's a great solution. So this is, this is wonderful, and I feel like we're building the conversation up towards uh, why, you f why you feel the deep space food movement, movement should be a universal call to action. I mean, why does this, why does this even matter in the first place? I know, I know all of us sort of, uh, all of you have sort of touched on this subject, but why, why does it matter so much? Helen? Um, I think it matters because um, the work on food in space definitely can yield exciting possibilities. I think that it's already starting to show um, what the results can be for food on Earth. Uh, for example, space research um, can lead to better ways to preserve food, to reduce waste. Waste is a tremendous problem that we're having. And a lot of times, uh, uh, solutions that are found in very different types of contexts, including space, are actually solutions you would have never found if you had just looked at um, the possibilities here. So it's quite clear that space radiation, for instance, um, could induce mutations that could make varieties more resilient, for instance. Uh, producing nutritious food with minimal resources, such as water, can also be applicable on Earth in areas with extreme environments, such as desertification. Um, where there is very little available water sources. So we need to start looking at how we are going to adapt. This is why we're talking about this movement also on climate adaptation. Climate adaptation, it's climate change is not going to end all of a sudden, right? But climate adaptation can slow it down. And definitely um, the deep space food movement and the exploration that is being done in space, as has been done for many materials, Materials in the past have been used and developed in space, which are now being used today, for instance, um, in, in firefighting, for instance, in uh, military contexts. The materials were developed in space, which make 
our um, capacity to be stronger here on Earth. And it's the same thing when we're looking at now innovative systems um, within food, within waste, um, and, and addressing the climate crisis. Excellent. Ben, I'd love to hear what you were going to say. Yeah, I would think also from a social point of view, I think the space <coughs> is one of the best examples of we see of people from all over the world working together. We see these pictures of all these astronauts with all the different flags on their arms. And, um, you know, that's why it really brings together all different types of cuisines and it shows how connected we are. Um, I'm part of the uh, Space Generation Advisory Council and I'm so excited to see, you know, how many different, we had 50 different countries represented at SGC uh, last week. And so I'm so excited to, to work with all of them in order to find these sort of solutions moving forward. And that's why I'm also glad that Star Lab Oasis was placed in Abu Dhabi, my, my job, because um, we're bringing together this international cohort and we're looking not just at, you know, the foods from North America, but from around the world, because we want to make sure that the first uh, people on Mars aren't just from one country. We want to make sure that that is an international effort, and we need to make sure that our food system um, supports that, and um, systemically make sure that our greenhouse supports you know, food from around the world, food that you know, I've never even tried before, but I'm very excited to be trying in Dubai here. So um, yeah, from a social point of view, it, it really brings everyone together, and it shows you know, how we need to have solutions from all over like you all have with the Deep Space Food Challenge um, in order to solve this problem. So I think that's a beautiful segue into my next question, which is what, what role do you think does open innovation and international collaboration play in solving these complex problems? I mean, obviously the Deep Space Food Challenge was an open international prize competition, um, which would indicate that maybe NASA scientists and other uh, uh, food scientists across space agencies haven't solved some of the mo more complex problems. So what are your thoughts on that, Anil? Um, well, maybe I'll bring here um, just the experience we had um, uh, participating with Deep Space Food Challenge. Um, because we are, by, by definition, we are an heterogeneous team. So we have food scientists, engineers, um, space engineers, mm -hmm. um, cognitive food, at least is how they define, and I'm still um, trying to understand what uh, this means, but cognitive food experts and, <laughs> and so on. We, um, we participated and we discovered that uh, we started with just uh, one product that was, uh, you know, nu mm, matching nutrition with hedonics, as I, as I said. And by the way, this is, this is the product just for the advertising uh, scope I'm here. And, uh, but, uh, but then we discovered that there was more, much more. So we um, um, matched up with, uh, we team up with uh, um, a French Israeli company, Aleph Farms, and uh, we discovered that we can do, you know, more. Now we are starting with a new line that is on personalized food. So, and this was uh, possible because we opened our, our mind, so we truly act open innovation and truly international, and we are now discovering that we can personalize maybe food according the nutrition need and also according other, you know, uh, keeping in mind the resource efficiency and, and, and all these things. And this is just the experience we, we got from. So we are really thrilled in, uh, yes, going forward with it, but also with the uh, challenge, but also starting new lines. So open innovation and internationalization definitely are two pillars of, uh, of activities that we want to go forward with this. Excellent. Uh, Stefan? Maybe I want to look at it from a different perspective. We're saying, how can space help you? How can exploration help you? But we should also think, how can you help exploration? And more than 1,000 years ago, both in, in, in uh, uh, South America, Latin America, and in Africa, people were eating spirulina. Um, it's a protein-rich algae, um, and actually we're investigating that to use that also on the space station. Uh, and you could say, well, Today on Earth, it's a luxury food supplement. Okay, so what? Uh, we can also take others to the space station, but guess what? If you grow spirulina, you take uh, CO2 out of the air and you produce oxygen. Mm -hmm. So actually that is one of our components of our life support system. Um, and that is perfectly relevant also here on Earth. Um, and actually we have spin-offs of that already. Um, there are architects that have devised photobioreactors 
put it in a facade of a building um, and grow spirulina um, on a very um, efficient way, uh, much if more efficient than in open ponds. Um, the heat generated is used for heating the building. Uh, so you see, it's, it's a whole circular um, um, concept. This is contamination <coughs> from different factors. You know, so the, the architect using food, maybe, or, or, or vice versa. But this is truly contamination. This is what uh, open innovation is yeah. at the end of the day. So uh, contaminating between maybe different uh, sectors and, and, uh, and skills uh, to generate new, solu new solutions for uh, maybe common or global challenges. Right. Excellent. Well, for me, one of the, um, the most beautiful, most inspiring things about the Deep Space Food Challenge is that we've seen teams across the world come together. Uh, not, and it's not just um, uh, ethnic diversity um, or uh, racial diversity we're talking about. We're talking about uh, diversity of thought. We're talking about generational diversity and diversity across industries. For the first time that I have known, people like um, uh, people who are studying to be chefs, we have, um, we have Michelin, Michelin star chefs working alongside food scientists, engineers, um, packaging scientists. These people who otherwise would never rub shoulders with each other are working towards solving this a, a, a crucial problem, a critical problem. And that to me is just such a beautiful story to tell. Um, and I'm really excited about phase two for when, for when we can kick that off and we are able to see the actual kitchen table demonstrations of these teams' technologies. Martha, did you want to say something? Well, I was just going to talk about um, my um, friend Charles Simone went to outer space twice as a paying, as a paying tourist to the ISS. And, um, and I worked with Ellen Ducasse to create some dishes that would be uh, delicious for the rest of the crew and for, uh, for Charles uh, on his visits. And uh, those chefs are so anxious to contribute uh, their knowledge and their expertise and their recipes uh, to, uh, to space food. Uh, again, it's not as sustainable for a trip to Mars as it is to uh, a 13-day trip to the International Space Station, but, but it is a step in the right direction in terms of, uh, of offering those, um, those astronauts uh, good, sustainable, delicious food that will keep them from going crazy while they're you know, <laughs> traveling seven months to Mars and then two years up there. And we have to figure out ways to really help them. That's an amazing point. Can we dig more into this? So, so uh, Helen, yes? Yeah. yeah, I really wanted to bounce off that because as a matter <laughs> of fact, um, you know, it, it is also really important to think about all of the people who are working in the space industry who go up to space. What are we doing in space? What are we doing in space? And we were just talking about this with Bernard, is it, you know, in, in space, we have the capacity now to look at the planet, to be able to see where are some of the areas that where, where we need to really work on in terms of crops, what is happening in terms of climate change, that from space we can foresee the impact of climate change and therefore address it more systemically mm -hmm. and more and more rapidly. But we can also do a lot in terms of seeing the movements of populations, in terms of migration, in terms of um, war, and be able to inform in terms of the actions to be able to reduce um, the uh, you know potential catastrophes. So we have to also think about all of these people who are working there. And actually, I was speaking to um, to 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 a friend whose uh, husband, um, Thomas Pesquet, goes uh, to the International Space Station and was talking about the difficulties that many um, um, astronauts have in terms of their nutrition, right? And that they, that despite all of the work and these innovative chefs that are working to make sure that astronauts have um, nutritious uh, elements, it's still not sufficiently sustainable right, depending on how long the trip is. And they come back oftentimes um, very reduced in terms of their, of their power. And so that's also something that really needs to work on. So it's not just what does space do for us, but what do we do for space? Because really, it's indivisible, very much like the sustainable development goals. And Bernard? No, I, I just think we are just astronauts of Spaceship Earth. So it's not only those of my friends that, uh, again, I envy them, they are in orbit. <laughs> and, uh, 
we ask a lot of specific, specific person what they do. Um, they have to implement solution, solution to be, uh, should we do science? Huh? All of us should be scientists, engineers, uh, they, uh, they also um, serve the, the community. And so what they do also is supported by a thousand of people that are working together internationally from various disciplines where we value diversity, we value innovation. And so all of that should inspire us, astronauts from Spaceship Earth, also to look at solution for that we have uh, for Spaceship uh, Earth. So for that, we, we do that uh, in our analog mission. We have done a long duration mission, spending one year on Mars. And so there are also some little uh, recipe. If you, if you want uh, not to fight with your neighbor, just do science, just do activities, uh, learn, grow food. Also taking care of your own food, uh, uh, going back to this uh, basic, uh, uh, well, basic uh, task that we used to do uh, uh, before. And then we can reconnect with our humanity and we do that together internationally. Another way also, uh, we give them a lot of work and they hate me because I'm their flight director. It's a very good way to bond any, uh, any team. So find a, a way to support them and uh, give them uh, challenges. And those type of challenges, then you can apply to daily problem uh, that we have to solve together, but also with a global view and being innovative. Hannah, I think I saw you. I know you're dying. <laughs> I, I was just, I think for me, it's like, the. I mean, we ship things all over the world in a day, but for me, it's like uh, in America, we're very limited in some of the food. We have people from all different nationalities. So you'll have some grandma, it's our grandmothers, our great grandmothers who are still growing the food that they brought from Italy, that one tomato and saffron in Philadelphia on their rooftop because they want to make that risotto. And so for me, it's like an international nutritional bank now. Like what are the phytochemicals in the original wild blueberry in America? There's only four fruits native to North America. Wild blueberries, cranberries, conquer grapes, pawpaw. Um, so where did you get your nutrition, but also the first variety of it, not the bread. So if you're gonna go to space, bring the best stuff, the most nutritious. And I think most of us, are nutritionally lacking because we're eating food that's not picked right away. It's 10 days delivery, like, you know, everything. So we all are not getting the nutrients we need to live a long, healthy life. Um, so I'm really excited that we can look at this nutritional bank. Like tangerines are the only thing that have tangier, which is a phytochemical. Now that might be one of the things that's great in space or that can solve things. Or First Nation people in, Ameri in the North Americas they have their corn from their, eighth, like the original corn, everyone, there's 600 recognized nations, and that's just, there are probably thousands, and they all have 10 or 20 varieties of corn, the original maize. That is the most nutritional food you can eat. So, and then they process it, so fermenting, you know, two, three years, it's finally good enough to eat, right? So, there's a, the fermenting, and I think it was so incredible to see all the teams, I was a judge, like they use fermenting, they use vinegars, they use mushrooms. It was just incredible to see how they use these. So anyway, that's. I just wanted to say, Hannah, it was cool that you brought that up because when you when you talk about picking, you know, getting fresh food, one of the things I love about this challenge is it almost necessitates in, largely in, in situ food production. So when you're talking about farm to table, you know, it's literally right there. It grows. It's all. That's that's always pretty much how you want it to be. And so if you can take that technology and bring it back down to earth to make it economical, you end up with a decentralized food economy. So the food's better, it's more nutritious, uh, and it doesn't you know, yeah, like I was gonna chain. Like I was saying, like in America, there's a big kelp. People are growing kelp for carbon, CO2, but also for nutrition. But really, we don't have a history of it. The fir uh, and First Nation people do. It's Japan that has been growing kelp and seaweeds forever. They're actually having problems because the soil is what nutrients. So if there's no rain, the kelp is this big. So actually all the minerals come from the soil into the ocean. People don't realize that, like seagrass. And so it's really interesting to see so many teams had kelp, had seaweed in their processes or little teeny minnow fish, which was amazing instead of tilapia. But anyway, so exciting. Stefan? Yeah, maybe I throw in again space with exploration. Uh, Thomas Pesquet was mentioned. He's currently uh, on the station. He will be joined 31st of October by 
uh, Matthias Maurer, our German uh, PISA astronaut. They go in space to experience microgravity, weightlessness. Um, and Thomas Pesquet, he has a mission patch uh, with all the 17 colors of the SDGs. Um, one of the SDGs is uh, zero hunger by 2030. So it's crystal clear uh, what we have to do. And he has this mission patch. He's Goodwill Ambassador for the Food uh, and Agriculture Organization of the UN. Um, those are all nice words, publicity. But up there, they're also doing in practice things that can help. Um, and in microgravity, uh, you can do experiments uh, where you can find out things which you cannot find out on Earth because gravity is disturbing our view. Um, and we do experiments like boiling uh, foam. And, and we have companies like Nestle who, who look into foam, who f how foam is formed uh, in, in microgravity to learn better the process and to make a better chocolate mousse, for instance. Um, so from that perspective, we're encouraging companies, terrestrial companies, to look what we can do in space to optimize their products, services, their applications um, uh, by doing research in, in space. Uh, but in my opinion, if we need to think not only on doing experiments or running experiments in space, but uh, we want to live there, stay for a long time in, in space, so um, there's another aspect coming into the picture uh, that somehow, you know, you mentioned uh, different cultures, different uh, countries and so on. So the human factors, in my opinion, are something that uh, we need to also to, to, to tackle because, uh, for instance, the psychology of flavor in space is different. You, you sense flavor very differently, so you have to, you know, consider. And the, 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 mm, you eat with eye, yes, but you, you know, you feel with brain. So if you don't feel the flavor as you feel in, on Earth, maybe on space, you don't eat some certain food and you miss some nutrition facts or some other, other aspects. But the human factors are, are, very, you know, are, are very important and even in, in terms of, uh, of culture and, and so on. Food is really you know, an incredible vehicle also to, 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 to match it. It's also practical, uh, it's hygiene. You, you don't want to crumble because there's no gravity, the crumbles will not fall down. They will float around, start clogging systems, whatever. So devising a good texture for your food, which is also very important, also from that perspective. And, and taste. We, uh, we mentioned Thomas Pesquet, we mentioned German astronaut. So for Par Condicio, I mentioned Paolo Nespoli, so the Italian astronaut. And when he went there, he, he assembled and tried the coffee machine, the coffee in space. So not to make any, any comment on that, but uh, you know, uh, when he came back, so I had a talk with him and uh, I immediately asked him how was the coffee there. So he said, okay, it was hot, it was uh, black, it was, uh, you know, liquid and so on. But, you know, it's very different sensing the water boiling, sensing the smell, having, you know. So this is really human factor. So you have that machine there, you have a technology there to, to, to make your coffee. That, by the way, the part of this technology has been um, transferred also to medical sector, the, the cardiovascular valves and so on. But you might not use that, or drink that coffee because you are not feeling, you don't have that human factor. So this is happening for coffee, but might happen also for other kinds yeah, of food. Now I have to throw in another astronaut, uh, Frank Duwin. <laughs> he also drinks coffee on station. Um, the, the water used for the coffee is recycled, also from the urine. So one of his quotes is, well, one day I drink a cup of coffee. The other day, I drink the same cup of coffee. And the next day, I drink my colleague's cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, oh, James, go ahead. Really, really briefly There's no one. coffee break here, right? <laughs> 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 In about, in about 11 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just wanted to really quickly jump off of that. I, I think um, it's one of the things I was so happy about in terms of the international competition is that um, you really need to bring a lot of cultures uh, into this. Uh, obviously, everybody knows that when astronauts get to space, the food doesn't taste so great, uh, and they start putting a whole lot of spicy stuff on it to try to actually feel like it tastes like anything. And so I, I, this is something that's been always kicking around in my head. There's numerous cultures in the world where you have different spices that are very, very potent on Earth, but in space might not be so great, or might not be so potent. Um, but the flavors that come together that have, you know, the competition between all the folks who are creating a culture over time and creating a food culture over time, you end up with something really, really beautiful at the end, and that's why you have different kinds of food today. And so you want to take that to space and it actually, 
uh, have it work together versus something where it's like, oh, okay, here's some food that is kind of like what I'm used to at home, and I'm going to completely change it to make it taste like anything. There's cultures already who are, are, are uh, have something that has those kinds of rich, kind of powerful food experiences. It's already built into the product. So that's actually food for thought. Um, so uh, for <laughs> See what I did there. Um, uh, Co Koreans, for instance, and so many other cultures have fermented foods. None of that goes to space because uh, all of the all the bacterial strains apparently are are uh, potentially dangerous in that environment. However, the particular strains that are dangerous for that environment have not yet been isolated. So, wouldn't that be an interesting problem to solve if European uh, or or Korean astronauts can have their yogurt, have their kimchi? and also help uh, build their, their gut microbiome, which by the way, we're only scratching the surface of, of those uh, microbiome gut um, studies, but that, that would be something, right, that would, that, help, that would help an astronaut feel more connected to Earth, eating the foods that they grew up with, um, and of course would have a psychological impact, I would imagine. Helen? That research can then also be brought back down to earth for the benefit of many more, right? And in not, not just within that, that space. So I think that, again, we're touching on this very important aspect of, of the circularity of this research, right? We're talking now about like medical research, potentially. Um, and, and, and also the fact that we're, we're talking also about the diversity of cultures um, and the fact of being recognized within this international space, right, where all, in, in the end, the boundaries collapse there. There are no boundaries. This is zero people working together. And that recognition of identities is so extremely important today. Mm -hmm. um, but I think linked to that is also, and this is something I just wanted to touch on very quickly, is as um, this work is being done and as this research continues, there's a lot that's being done in terms of um, plant development processes in the absence of gravity with potential applications in improving, in improving crop productivity and especially multi-crop productivity, mm -hmm. which is also a, a, a very important emergency today because monocropping is really degradating the earth, right? And if we want to keep growing sustainably and if we don't want to destroy the land that is being used to feed us, we need to multi-crop. And the multi-cropping is actually something that smallholder farmers specifically um, are wor work on, but that this research being done in space can really um, support in terms of innovative processes. To be able to save um, the earth that we're using, which is already extremely um, degraded in terms of being able to grow food mm -hmm. nutritiously. So isn't it beautiful then that we have initiatives like the Deep Space Food Challenge that help address um, driving innovation, accelerating innovation, that helps solve for problems here on Earth while we look into a future into the stars and being an interplanetary species, right? It's not an either or conversation. This is, that is a, in my opinion, a false dichotomy. Uh, this is a human factors thing. We're, we're all human beings and we're all solving uh, the, the, the challenge of getting the nutrition that we need. So um, to uh, Helen's point, Martha, I'm curious, how many species of, of uh, vegetables and fruit do you, are you growing uh, on your land well, right Well, I grow probably, uh, well, many, many, many different things. Um, maybe 20 kinds of basil, maybe 30 different kinds of tomatoes. Um, I, I search for the rare and the unknown, and I, I collect seeds from all over the world. I visited the seed vault up in, um, in Svalbard in Norway, in the, near the North Pole, to see what they were up to. And it's quite admirable, the collection of seeds and, and uh, from all over the world, um, the uh, original seeds from, from all the different African countries. And some are calling back. If they have a natural disaster, they can call the, the seed vault. And, get those same seeds back to their country if the a whole crop has been wiped out, a, a special um, a variety or hybrid or whatever. But it's very interesting um, to try to grow all these different things. I don't know if that's so important uh, ultimately uh, to have all that variety. I don't, think, I don't think that's where the world is going. I just think that we have to find the, the, the vegetables and the fruits that are the most nutritious and the most sustainable, the most easily grown 
uh, and work on that more than, than on so, so much variety. So I wanted to say that there, it, science is very important. So innovation and science, and for instance, we have been also working on, uh, uh, we have exposed uh, to space uh, some seeds to see uh, what happened to them and uh, whether in the future we could use them. We believe also that beyond nutritive, you can have also medicinal properties of some of the plants, so it's important also to keep some variety. And I want also to give another example where bacteria can be your friend. And actually, I, I brought with me a piece of the moon. I have a sample of the moon with, with me. <laughs> and we have made experiments with the moon soil analog. Is this are, in fact, um, a powder of ashes of volcano. This is the poorest soil you can find. But we found a good bacteria that take all the elements out of it. And we were able to grow a first generation plant out of it. And so this bacteria helps to to, to grow and to protect against parasites, uh, to blossom. And we could grow a French marigold. And uh, this French marigold, after, you was used as a first generation plant that we could uh, use to enrich the very poor soil. And then we could grow a large diversity of other plants. So for the moon, we will look what are the ones that will survive in the radiation environment. Eventually, they will mutate as well. But it's very important to keep a diversity. So that's why a bit like uh, the vault of Svalbard, we also sought to have a Noah's Ark on the moon where we can protect species of the whole uh, biosphere, vegetal, animal. Also in case something very, very bad happened on Earth, we have a plan B. Yes, so we have an international moon-based alliance uh, working on that. We have with us Anchorages, the owner of Tetris, is investing uh, some uh, of his uh, action into that and also in uh, uh, fighting climate change. And so this is something where uh, space, science, and bacteria can be our friends. So <coughs> I'd like to sort of uh, wrap, wrap things up here because we only have a few minutes. But um, I want to thank everyone again for coming to this discussion, to this fireside chat, and offering uh, your perspective. Uh, I want to call out that these are subject matter experts in, in very specific domains that touch on food. But I, I love the diversity of, pr of perspective that we have on the stage and the stories that you have to tell. So real quickly, my last question, if you can, if you can keep it to like five seconds or less. If you could take, if you were going on a long duration mission, like let's say a three year mission, and if you could take only one or two kinds of foods with you, your need to, your need to have, what would that be? Blueberries. Just bam. Blueberries. Okay. Okay, Blueberries. Ben. <laughs> Took mine. Uh, saffron. Uh, I make saffron water, and I probably take saffron and rice. Um, I am a sommelier, so I would go with wine. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, uh, <laughs> oh, I knew. Uh, uh, and and some dessert, some sweets. But I started with ratatouille. No? So with uh, Gaston, I will end up with Ratatouille as well. So uh, quoting uh, uh, Antoine Ego, the food critic, and he was asking for perspective, serving some perspective. This is what I would love to, to have in space, also from the food side. Okay, Martha? Oh, I'd say something like paella, mm -hmm. but many things, my, <laughs> my paella. <laughs> Your paella, okay, I'm gonna have to get that recipe. Stefan? I'm from Belgium, chocolate. That's good. Helen? Uh, yeah, uh, I'd have to take chocolate too, but um, I'd probably also take seeds. You know, everything that's uh, n nuts and seeds that I think, you know, I, c I could always have in case there's nothing else. Bernard? Um, I want to, uh, to bring culture. <laughs> and the culture, this is in form of a, a tray where we would have an uh, art piece like we want to send to the moon in 2024 with a project called Moon Gallery. And inside, we have also some seeds. And so I could bring along so my culture, my museum of art, but uh, also I could have seeds that I can plant uh, uh, when I'm on, on my way to Mars or, or when I retire on the moon in 20 years. And I, I would like that we have such a panel in 20 years uh, uh, that I can host on my uh, villa on the moon. Excellent. Indeed. Oh, uh, I'd, <coughs> I'd, I'd, I'd say Korean barbecue, but I think that would be cheating. It's too many things. <laughs> um, but probably a potato. 
Potatoes would be, if I had to pick something, I feel like it would probably keep me alive. Um, or, you know, uh, just a baguette a day. Uh, crumbs be damned. There was, there was the space bread. They made oh, it. Oh, that's right. Yeah, no, there was. And it's a pretty cool idea. Yeah. No crumbs. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone, again, for coming. No, what about you? Oh, oh, yeah, me. Uh, uh, chocolate. And the, the dark chocolate has some caffeine in it. I have so some that. here, right? If you, if you want. <laughs> Uh, my daughter told me we have to save the oh, earth. It's the only planet with chocolate. <laughs> Thank you again, everyone. And Martha, I'm going to have to get that paella recipe. Oh, I have it. <laughs> oh, you want to go